Good afternoon. This afternoon, we're going to capitalize on a success we had. The success of showing the community here the public work that we did over three nights of the life and times of Ernest Hemingway. So I thought I would talk to you a little about Ernest Hemingway. He was a journalist and he learned his trade very well. He came from the area near Chicago and he was basically first and foremost a trained journalist. That meant he learned quickly how to write with nouns and verbs, nouns and verbs. And he learned how to write in the present tense and in the active voice. That meant no passive voice. When he wrote something like, I saw Joe DiMaggio at the New York Yankees throw a home run or hit a home run, he told the story as it was. And so when he started to write fiction, he did the same thing. He um, is an amazing man in many ways because he left the United States as quickly as he could and he really never came back. He went off to war. He volunteered before we were in World War I to be an ambulance driver in Italy. And that's where he got his first experience in war and where he wrote his first great novel, A Farewell to Arms. That novel has never been made into a successful film. It finally ran out of its copyright and then Selznick sent Hemingway, by then living in Cuba, a check for a lot of money because he was going to make it into a film with his wife, Jennifer Jones. Well, it was a horrible film. Jennifer Jones was the wrong person and Rock Hudson was the wrong man to star in this particular film. Hemingway knew that from the beginning. He sent the check back with a note saying, you need this money worse than I do. If you think your 30 year old wife can play my 18 year old nurse and the rock person can play her lover. And the film was a disaster. So we learned from the old Hemingway what the new Hemingway was like. He had gone to Italy. he had been in the Great War, he had seen action, and Caporetto. Caporetto was a great battle on the Italian front between the Italians, obviously, and the central powers of Germany. And when he drove his ambulance, he had many engagements that made him know something about war and also involved him in the calisthenics of the problem that he had. He also was in love with the nurse. And finally, the two of them decided to leave the war, to walk away. And they got to Switzerland. Unfortunately, she was very advanced in her pregnancy and she lost the baby. He tells us beautifully in this remarkable book. And then he did what many young Americans did at the time. Maybe you don't know much about the 1920s and the age of the people who became the lost generation. They ended up in Paris. It was the favorite gathering place of lots of Americans. One in particular ran a very famous group. She is notorious for having said of Oakland, quote, there's no there there. Her name is Gertrude Stein, and she collected around her a number of famous Americans. They included the great other novelist who had just written a book. And so suddenly this place became a noted gathering place for expatriates or even other foreigners who were living in Paris. People like Pablo Picasso joined the group. And he then invented his new way of painting, which was very helpful for people to understand the modern age. But we have this 
young man, part of the lost generation. So in his first established book, which wasn't Farewell to Arms, it was The Sun Also Rises. He tells the story of Lady Brett Ashley and a young man who was injured in the war. He's very much injured in the lower body parts, so he's not able to conceive a child with Lady Brett. The two of them make a very famous trip to Spain to see the bull races at a very famous city in Spain where they race the bulls. And in that process, they make then later the film at MGM and we'll be showing that to you. That is, we will show you the sun also rises. And I wish to say to you that the best performance in it is given by a drunk who was a drunk by nature and his name was Errol Flynn, and he's seen in the film and is very, very good at what he has to do, which is play drunk. This idea of going to Spain captured Hemingway's imagination, and he went always back to Spain whenever he could. And so you have three phases to his life. You have the Italian phase, where he drives an ambulance in World War I. Then you have the Paris phase where he writes the sun also rises and then you will later have the uh, famous book. Of the Spanish Civil War book for whom the bells told. So what to say about him. He was uh, a good writer. He was a lousy husband. He had a number of wives. He often spoke badly of Hollywood. He said, if you're going to write for Hollywood, what you want to do is never go there. Go at midnight to the border with California, have your manuscript in a bag, throw it across the border into California and have them throw you the money on the other side and then walk away, never go in. He thought very badly of what they had done in his mind to his very good friend in the early days and that was the guy who wrote the great gatsby and it was the nature of things that it wasn't hollywood that ruined things for that particular writer it was the fact that he was loyal to his wife his wife was zelda and zelda was a southerner high strung and she had a nervous breakdown and so it was that uh, he put her in an asylum and stayed to watch over her. In the process, fell in love with a gossip columnist named Sheila Graham, who wrote a famous book about this affair. And in that process, she told all that you could understand something about Scott Fitzgerald and his unique problems. It was very much a failing of Hemingway that he never was able to stay long enough to lock anybody up because he was always getting divorced. So he was a user and an abuser when it came to women. And any one of them could tell you the last one lived him and outlived him. That was Mary Hemingway. Now something about his life. He ended up in Cuba. He loved Cuba. It was his real home. That's interesting to note because the Cubans are rioting this very day for the lack of support that they have not received from their government. And if you're interested in Cuba, you should know that we are responsible for most of the damage done to Cuba. I'll give you one example. Meyer Linsky was the head of the Jewish Mafia. I know it comes as a shock to some of you, but yes, Jews are also in the Mafia. What is, Cyrus lived in Florida. It's a state we should give back to Spain. I don't think they take it back from us though. And he ran all the gambling 
He ran all the prostitution and all the drug deals. So actually, when the Castro brothers took over, they did Cuba a favor by getting rid of this connection. But the connection is ugly and long. The big hotels in Havana, like the National Hotel, the floor shows that were run by young girls who were then used as hookers to ensnare rich Americans. So Cuba was an outlet for Americans who wanted to sin, but to be able to do so without having to pay the price. And when the Castro brothers came, they threw all these people out. So you can think about that today as these young Cubans today are in fact rioting as we speak. And one of the reasons they're doing so is that for some strange reason, President Biden has not lifted all the terrible things that we have done to the Cuban people so that all the terrible things that Trump did are still in power. And this is a great disservice to the Cuban people and something we will end up paying for in the long run. And why Biden has not turned his attention to this, which would be easy enough to do, to end all the special requirements that Cubans have to come to this country, to all the travel restrictions, to all the trade restrictions. Do you know that we have a law that doesn't allow a company to sell even aspirin, one bare aspirin to the Cuban people? And if you are seen doing it and your ship stops there, let's say a freighter and sells these items, you are then blackballed from entering the United States. So it certainly would be something that was well worth doing. But we go back to Hemingway. This was, sort of, and by the way, Hemingway thought that the Castro Revolution was a wonderful thing. So we have him back. He's lived in many places. He lived in Key West. The house he lived in there is now preserved, so you can go by and see the Hemingway house. But he ended up with his life in Cuba. He has a very famous finca. That is, he lives in where he lived in his day in the hills above Havana, Havana Viejo, the village of Havana. And he is remembered by the Cuban people as a national hero. And they have preserved everything he's ever done. If you go into the Hotel Mundo, the biggest hotel in Havana, you go to the fifth floor, you will find a room preserved exactly as it was when Hemingway wrote the last chapter of For Whom the Bell Tolls. The typewriter is there on the table. All the memorabilia is there, reminding the Cuban people that they had with them a great writer. Ernesto Hemingway. So what else can I tell you? Well, that's the Hotel Mundo. Around the corner is a bar, the Florida. And in that bar, they say they watched as Hemingway created the first daiquiri. And they then celebrated because the bar is named for him. And unfortunately, I couldn't find my t-shirt. I have a t-shirt that has Hemingway's picture on it and a daiquiri in his hand. A celebration of one of the things he did there. He was much loved by the Cuban people and he was much loved by the fishermen. He had his own boat. It's a boat he called the Pilar. Pilar is the name of a major character in For Whom the Bell Stole. And he went out fishing in that, and that'll be the last film we will show you in our film series, which will be The Old Man in the Sea. He also was celebrated by the fishermen who always went with him or looked after him. And so when he was dead, the fishermen got together and took all the old systems that rotated around their ships 
They were made out of uh, metal, and they had a metal artist come and shape the metal again so that it is a bust of it in some way, and it's right there on the fishing area. I don't know if you know Havana very well. It's, it's down a very long cut, so that when you get there, you have to come through this very narrow passage, water, with land on either side, and then you're in the old city. He uh, also was able to, as he spent his major parts of his years in Europe, to settle into this island that he loved. And he wrote some good and some mediocre books. We're gonna show you a film that was made of one of the most mediocre of the books called To Have and Have Not. The reason we chose that is that someone made an excellent film out of it. It's a film that introduces Lauren Bacall to the world, and she teaches Humphrey Bogart how to whistle. You just put your lips together and blow. And she made a sensation on her debut. Bogart had been married before, but he divorced his wife. He'd been in the Navy. He had a cut on his upper lip from a bullet that he had almost received in the head. And he and Bacall went on to make a number of very famous films, but maybe the most famous is the Hemingway film, The Have and Have Not. And then the last film we will show you will be one I've never seen before, which is The Old Man in the Sea. It's very hard to make a film out of an allegory, but we will try and let you see it if you can actually understand that it's not just catching a big fish and bringing the big fish into the harbor. It's an allegory about life, your own life, as you go through it and all the perils that you have to overcome. And the perils as seen in the allegory are the sharks that attack the fish. So that when you get to the end of your life, you will be there with just the eaten up old fish that's been eaten by sharks. It's a brilliant piece of work. His very last, last work was left for Mary Hemingway, his last wife, to finish for him. It's called A Movable Feast. And it's the story about the city that he loved more than any other. And it wasn't Havana, it was Paris. And his idea was that Paris was, if you were young and you lived there, was will go with you forever because it's a movable feast. It's a very beautiful, small book. And it was finished by his last wife. As I say, there were four of these wives. And before they gave up on Hemingway, he gave up on them. So as opposed to Scott Fitzgerald, who stayed with Zelda to the very end and tried to help her. And out of that, he wrote beautiful books like Tender is the Night, which also was made into a very decent film. And of course, the always great, Great Gatsby, which has been made into three films. None of them as good as the book itself. So we go back to Hemingway in his first stages. He was writing and writing well. He was given a lot of advice by Gertrude Stein, who was using her salon to advise a lot of people who were in both the writing world or in the painting world. And he listened carefully to what they had to say. Because again, he realized that he had with these very talented people around him a chance to grow as a writer. But always again, he learned to write with nouns and verbs and always in the active voice. And therefore, it was perfect for the movies. And as much as he disliked film and disliked the motion picture industry, he wanted to be able to sell to them. So his solution was to meet them at midnight at the border with California and throw a bag full of the documents that he's got and get back for them a bag full of money and then to run away. What more can I tell you about this famous author? He loves Spain. And so he had an Italian phase, farewell to arms. He had a French phase, sun also rises, 
and he has a Spanish face for whom the bell tolls. And when he had to follow his own heart, he knew it was best to write only what he knew. So unlike other people who wrote about Spain, Hemingway went there. He listened to them. He listened to the people who were dying. He listened to them as a, I don't know if you know it, but most Spaniards are Roman Catholics. And there's a scene in which three young Spaniards are being shot at and they're about to die. And he makes it very lively to you because he has them saying the very famous prayer that Roman Catholics use, the Hail Mary. And they're saying it over and over again as the bullets pass them by and finally kill them. And if you read that seriously, it will break your heart because Hemingway had the feeling for what it was like to fight in war. He also had the feeling that he was restricted in his prose. When For Whom the Bell's Coal came out, he has the young American, played by Gary Cooper in the films, say to the young girl, played by Ingrid Bergman, quote, did the earth move for you, end quote. When I used to sign that book to Berkeley students, it was way after the revolution, so that no one talked like that anymore. They said they used the F word. So it was uh, difficult to explain to students that once before in the American literature of the early 20th and certainly through the 19th century, people did not talk like that. They talk like this man did to this girl. Did the earth move for you? But students couldn't believe that that was happening. They had been reading people who did use the F word rather frequently. So Hemingway was able to get to the real nature of what war was all about. He told it in a way that made it very real to people, always again using the active voice. The reason this was so important was that all of his books were turned into films because they were literally a film script already written. And many of them, even short stories, became great films. I'll give you one exact example. After his Italian phase, his French phase, and his Spanish phase, Hemingway fell in love with Africa. And he has several wonderful pieces that have been made into very good films. One is The Snows of Kilimanjaro, which was a wonderful film with Susan Hayward, Gregory Heck, and Ava Gardner. Again, trying to tell the story of Africa through an experience that he had. And he went to Kilimanjaro. Kilimanjaro is a mountain, the highest mountain in Africa. And there's a legend about Kilimanjaro. There was a leopard that died somewhere near the top of that mountain. And you should go and try and find the leopard if possible. And he returned to these themes over and over again. He has a book that's not very well received called The Green Hills of Africa. And he was he exhibited himself a great hunter. And when you go to the Finca, the house that he built in the hills above Havana, you will see many of the items are the work of taxidermists of uh, both, say, uh, Elephant, just the head, a rhino, just the head, and all of this posted around the Finca. He treasured this place on the island and very much wanted to be able to stay and live his life there. 
When he got ready to, I don't know if you know, he was born at the end of the 19th century and lived until the 1960s. So he was not that old when he shot himself. His father had also committed suicide. Several of the people in the family had committed suicide. So it seemed to be an easy way out. Rumor is that the great actor Gary Cooper was dying in Columbia Presbyterian Hospital of cancer. And that Hemingway visited him there. Hemingway loved to be around film people. Particularly if you were a very sexy person like Ava Gardner. And he visited Gary Cooper, who was his choice to be the young Americans in for whom the bell was told. And he saw this horrible death. And the story is that when he was diagnosed with cancer himself, rather than to die in agony, as Cooper did, he would kill himself. So he did go off back to the United States, not to Key West, one of his favorite places, but way out west. And then he shot himself bringing to a close a great life. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was acknowledged as one of the great American writers. He was somebody I always told my students they should read when they were very young. Because as you get older, you lose some of the mystery that's there. And then the book doesn't work for you. But all of these books have always worked for me. He's my favorite writer among all those. Although I also like The Great Gatsby and books like that, Tender is the Night. So what more can I tell you? We in the United States today are responsible for many of the problems that involve Cuba and they were problems for Hemingway. He felt like when the Cuban Revolution took place and the embargo was set up that he'd never be able to go back to his home in Havana or even drive along the Metacom, the long river of salt water that leads into the old part of the city of Havana. And he couldn't go back. He could go back to Key West. But that was it couldn't go back to Paris anymore because he was old. Paris was a movable piece in one way, but it wasn't that easy to go to. As you find out when you live in Piedmont Gardens and can't go running back to Paris every time you want to. Hemingway did the best that he could out of all the things that fell his way. He was very much a lousy, lousy husband. In many ways, he was a, uh, what shall we call it? Well, to the women in his life, he was not nice. And then he would apologize, but the apology came a little too late. And so many of them, like Gellhorn, she left him. And the only one who stayed at the very end of his four wives was Mary. And she was there to publish his last book, since Movable Feast did not come out while he was alive. By the time his last books came out, he was such bestsellers that Scribner's, who came to his publisher, would actually make deals so that if you read The Old Man in the Sea, you could read it in two forms. You could buy the small, it's a really a novella, book, or you could buy Life magazine, because Life made a deal with Hemingway's publisher, Scribner's. They would publish the entire novella in Life magazine. It's a very famous edition of Life. I used to have it. I don't know what happened to it, but you could see these deals always brewing because Scribner's made a lot of money publishing everything Hemingway wrote. It didn't matter what, whether it was any good or not. And therefore, there's a lot of second-rate work out there. But there's a lot of first-rate work, too. 
And sometimes it's about Italy, sometimes about France, sometimes about Spain, and always about Africa. So that he had a reputation, both as a womanizer, which was unfortunate, and as a great gamesman. He likes to go to Africa and shoot. He likes to go to Africa and take photos. He was good at both. And he made his life around it, and then he wrote it as a book. There is no great, really big Africa book, but there are two very good Africa short stories. The most famous is The Snows of Kilimanjaro. There was also one sport that Kimmy thought he knew a lot about. That was bullfighting. So he didn't just go to Spain to the Spanish Civil War, which was a great setting for his last really big book. But he went to Spain for the bullfights. And he got to know bullfighters. And he got to try and think about them, what it was to face death. So there's a small book called Death in the Afternoon, which talks about the bullfighter and what he must be thinking about as he faces death every afternoon in the years to come and what it's like to kill the bull when the bull is finally dead or if he doesn't die then you die it's a nice choice i don't know what else i can tell you about hemingway he um he very much wanted to be a part of the effort in world war ii so he organized a, in his own little fishing boat, a little flotilla. And they went around using, I don't know if you know Florida, but Florida is a peninsula and up the west coast goes, or the east coast goes the Gulf Stream. And in that Gulf Stream, the Grand Admiral Donuts assigned actually in the end four submarines they had a purpose the submarines were there to sink some very special kind of shipping there were two things that were bothering the americans as the war broke out one texas where most of the oil came from was not connected with the pipeline to the east coast that is to new jersey where you see all those many, many, many refineries. So it had to come from Texas down and around the Florida Peninsula and up the East Coast. And so it was a perfect target for German subs. There was another very critical item that we didn't have. One of the things you make airplanes out of, you must, you see it all the time. You get it from bauxite. And when you refine bauxite, you get aluminum. And the bauxite deposits that we knew of were in Venezuela and Colombia. So large amounts of bauxite had to be shipped at least as far as New Orleans. And then from there, overland, to where the bauxite could be turned into aluminum. And the aluminum could be turned into what? A lot of airplanes to bomb the Germans or to bomb the Japanese. It's quite easy. And the Germans knew this better than we did. So there were submarines in the channel between Florida and Cuba and in the Gulf of Mexico. So knowing this, Hemingway decided to take the Pilar, which was his own sailing ship, and organize a attempt to identify these submarines and then get an American destroyer to come and destroy it. It was not successful, to say the least. Little Cuban fishing boats are not a real option against a high-tech German submarine. But Hemingway did his best, so he felt very much contributing to this effort. Hemingway was also determined, as he could be, to not miss 
World War II. Since he had been in World War I, he'd been to the Spanish Civil War, now was his attempt to be involved and see so that he could write a great book about World War II. So he raced his then wife, who was also a journalist, to London to be there. And then he tried desperately to get himself onto the beaches at Normandy. Now let me tell you a little story. The man in charge of the Normandy landings was Dwight David Eisenhower. And Dwight David Eisenhower had enough trouble because Winston Churchill had decided he would go in the first wave onto the beaches at Normandy. So finally, General Eisenhower had to call the palace. I don't know if many of you have ever called Buckingham Palace. Not just anybody can call and not just anybody answers. But finally he identified himself as General Eisenhower and he needed to speak to the king. So a few minutes went by and the king, as King George, comes to the, to the phone and says, Yes, General Eisenhower, how can I help you? And Eisenhower says, you have got to stop Winston Churchill from trying to go on the first wave to the beaches at Normandy. He shouldn't go over there at all. But we will let him go after we have the beachhead secured, if that will make him feel better. And there were two British beaches of the five that were there. So the king simply said, I understand. And he called the prime minister and said, I do not want you to go to Normandy until I give the word. And so Churchill didn't go to land. But guess who did, who just landed in London? And that was Ernest Hemingway. And he said, I'm going to get there one way or the other. And so he fiddled and fiddled and fiddled. And finally, he got himself with an organization that we had, uh, before we had a CIA, we had something called the OSS. And there was a man from the OSS in London ready to go over because we wanted to know everything we can about the retreating Nazis. His name was Bruce. He was from one of the old families in Virginia. And so Hemingway made friends with him. And the two of them had a plan to sneak, and they did. They got onto a landing craft illegally, and they landed in the second wave at Normandy. And then they made their way in, and of course, the Nazis were retreating as fast as they could, and somebody named George Patton was soon to be there. So did many other famous Americans. So the process was one of who would get to liberate the city of Paris. Nobody cared about liberating some little dwarf out there on the road. They all wanted to be in on the kill, to include Charles de Gaulle, who had just also landed. So de Gaulle gets going, and so does Hemingway, Hemingway and his friend. De Gaulle being de Gaulle, he walked right into Paris with a still firing going on. That is, partisans had gone ahead of the troops. There was a French unit, the second French division, free French, under General Leclerc, was to take the surrender of Paris. In the meantime, Hitler had ordered the Paris be destroyed. In a very famous book called Brent Parisa, is Paris burning? And Paris was in fact, set up to be destroyed. All the great monuments, the Arc de Triomphe, all the great museums, the Louvre, were all loaded down with dynamite and they were to be blown up. So you have these mutual perils going on and then you have this writer, Ernest Hemingway, determined to get into the middle of it all and see it all. So what happens? Well, the French underground was very, very good. It was called the Marquis. And they learned about the attempt to blow up Paris and they worked ahead of time and dis 
connected all the things. So there was nothing blowing up. There was Hitler on the phone, his Wolfslayer in East Prussia calling, is Paris burning, Brent Parisa? And the answer was, oh, something has gone wrong here, Hitler. It's not blowing up. But where is Hemingway? Hemingway is right behind De Gaulle, right behind General Leclerc, and he and Bruce get into the city. What do they do? They go to the Ritz Hotel. <laughs> and at the Ritz Hotel, they liberate the bar in the Ritz Hotel. <laughs> and you can go there to this very day. I've gone there many times. And you can have a Hemingway special designed specifically for, and in a very special glass, the liberation of the Ritz Hotel by Ernest Hemingway and this other American, the OSS. So that shows you the nature of this writer. He never did end up writing a great book about World War II. But his experience there will show you that he learned very early as a junior journalist at the Kansas City Star to write what you know. Don't write what someone tells you. But you write what you know, and you write it with verbs and nouns, and you write it in the active voice. And suddenly you have a spellbinding item that can be quickly filmed, because it's exactly what Hollywood wants, is a film script that is already set. You know where you're going, you know what you want to look at, you know how to get there. And by now, films are being made on location. So the snows of Kilimanjaro was shot not in Hollywood, but in Africa. And For Whom the Bells Toll was shot in Spain. And The Sun Also Rises was shot in France. And the only tragedy was no one really made a great film out of Farewell to Arms, even though it is a marvelous, marvelous film. It just simply never came to the attention of the right people. So that's the Hemingway story. From beginning again, he worked as a young journalist for the Kansas City Star. He learned how to write there. And then he went on to write in Paris. He fought in the World War I on the Italian front way before we entered the war. He was there in many ways illegally. And he volunteered to go and he drove an ambulance. And that's the working because he's writing now what he knows of farewell to arms. And then the war is over and he is in Paris with a bunch of people who are called the lost generation. And that involves a lot of great American writers like John Dos Passos was there, Sherwood Anderson was there, and of course, Hemingway was there, and he was introduced to all the right people because he knew Gertrude Stein, and she ran this very famous, what shall we call it, the Salon. She and her friend, who was also from Oakland, Oakland's run claim to fame as these two gals running a salon in, 19, in 20th century early Paris, and so you get through all those people and you finally find that Hemingway is watching them, learning from them. He understands that this is a revolution going on all around him. There is this crazy Spaniard named Pablo Picasso, and he's just painted something that's revolutionary. And it's a Cubist masterpiece. And he understands what Cubism is so that he can incorporate that into his work. So you can see Hemingway describing things from various different angles, giving you a Cubist view of what this artist from another genre, from art painting over to a novel, it'll be a great novel. So it's almost quitting time. I want you to know that we are doing this lecture today to follow on with three of Hemingway's great 
books to films. It's the Hemingway Festival, and it will start with The Sun Also Rises. It's a good film. Unfortunately, all the leading actors are a little too old to play the roles. Ada Gardner was already over 30, and Lady Red Ashley in the book was only 18. But you will live through that Tyrone Power, and then, of course, Errol Flynn being Errol Flynn. And it's a good movie. And then we will give you To Have and Have Not, because it's a fine Bogart film, where Bogart finally meets Lauren Bacall. And then the last one will be the one that I've never seen, and I'm looking forward to it, and that's The Old Man in the Sea. You have to have patience for that film because The Old Man in the Sea is an allegory. The allegory is a life, your life. You lived a long time, and you had all these ups and these downs, and the ups and the downs end up with your being partially destroyed. So you'll get a chance to see that. And what else can I tell you? That will end our Hemingway series. We've had, and if you ever want to borrow, when for some reason you were out of town, you didn't get to see the PBS special on Hemingway, it's in three parts, you may borrow it from me because I have a collection there. And it's open for you to have. It's not just mine, but it's for you. In fact, it's so big and it's grown that I just found a film that I rented over three year, three months ago in the crack in my sofa. So I've left it for Renata to look at. It's a, uh, it might be a very, very good film, and then we will show it. If it's not, we would just apologize and quickly return it to the place where we borrowed it. So thank you very much for coming today and we'll see you again.